In the past few decades of economic competition with China and others, America has lost its capacity to manufacture many vital and strategic products. At the same time, China has actively studied and sought to exploit gaps in our technological capabilities. These grim developments have come together to threaten our nation's economic leadership, our nation's security, and global stability. For this reason, we must strengthen the skills and capabilities of the American workforce and American manufacturing. Although the challenges that we're confronting are not new, our task force findings indicate that we are at an inflection point. The task force has identified a number of concrete steps that Washington state governments and businesses must take together to build a more skilled workforce, to support innovation, and to strengthen our national security and economy. The starting point is the American worker. Our workforce is the source of every competitive advantage for our nation. And winning the war for talent is the foundational stone for prevailing in ge geopolitical competition. Manufacturing firms have studied and they have struggled to hire people. And productivity has stalled because America workers lack opportunities to develop new skills or to build technical credentials. As the pace of technological change accelerates, digitization and automation are creating demand for new skills faster than our current workforce training systems can keep up. The nation has, been, has seen spikes in the number of people looking for work and at the same time, spikes in the number of available jobs in manufacturing. And while that sounds like a paradox, it is indicative of the core workforce challenge that we face. Those looking for jobs are either in the wrong place or have the wrong skills to fill the openings. We must close the skills gap. We must repurpose federal education grants and funding to support employer-sponsored training programs. Employers should be able to compete for federal funding, usually reserved for colleges. Washington and state governments can further help workers by matching investments in training, by supporting students in select STEM programs, and by requiring colleges and universities to develop stackable credential pathways. Companies should take responsibility as well, and they should prioritize workforce development among their many priorities. These steps would attract talented people towards manufacturing jobs and build a workforce that's fluent in the digital technologies needed to preserve the U.S. strategic advantage. The second imperative is to increase access to capital. American firms do not compete on a level playing field. Other countries subsidize and protect their domestic industries. And China's use of unfair practices from industrial espionage to forced technology transfer is well documented. As a result, U.S. companies struggle to find low-cost capital and make vital investments in cutting-edge digital technologies, in more productive manufacturing processes, or in new facilities and plants. The status quo sets us back in the race for technological leadership. It hollows out our military capability, and it hurts American workers. That is why we believe the federal government should support innovative uses of public financing to attract private capital toward critical sectors of national security. This could take many forms, which are described in the report, but I want to highlight one in particular, a mission-focused sovereign fund. Modeled after sovereign wealth funds around the world, a U.S. industrial investment fund could provide long-term stable capital to strategic sectors through loans grants, and equity investments. And it could function as a central forum connecting public and private capital with researchers, innovators, and allies and partners. Whatever its design, America must leverage its uniquely dynamic capital markets to spur, focus, and competition in national security critical sectors. Next, we must address the fragility of the supply chain. Americans have become painfully aware of these vulnerabilities through the pandemic. As a nation, we must rebuild supplier ecosystems and improve policy coordination. Small and mid-sized manufacturing 
are disappearing at great cost, especially for our defense industrial base. Chinese dominance in manufacturing creates many challenges, but so do unstable budgets and poor government coordination. Congress can address some of these issues. Not only must we avoid a full year continuing resolution, but Congress can also update and modernize the Defense Production Act for an era of high tech and strategic competition. Finally, the United States must work closely with our allies in this effort. China has put forward clear plans to develop its own high tech industries, set technical standards, and win the technological race. Its strategy is well documented. It ties billions of dollars in investment and subsidies to industrial espionage and forced technology transfer. The United States must respond with speed and agility. We can strengthen our supply chains by leading a coordinated effort with our allies and partners. International competition cannot come at the expense of US interest or the security and well-being of Americans. Fortunately, the Trump administration laid the groundwork for this with the US-Mexico-Canada agreement and its work to combat Huawei. The recent submarine deal with Australia and the United Kingdom also shows the potential for greater military co collaboration. We should build on this foundation. We should secure America's vital supply chains through reshoring some production, sourcing goods from trusted partners, and building up our defense industrial base. If we do it right, we will build a counterbalance to China, strengthen our military, and create resiliency in our system so Americans can get the medical equipment, the cars, the electronics, and other valuable goods they need. This is just an overview of the task force. You can read it in great depth in this book, that, in this public pamphlet that you've received. But I do want to emphasize two conclusions. One is, that none of these recommendations will solve the problem alone. But if taken together, we are confident that they can begin to address the unacceptable status quo and reinvigorate our national workforce, our manufacturing capabilities, and enhance global security. And secondly, the time is now. We must act with haste. There's no time to waste. Before I leave the stage, I would like to thank again my co-chair, David McCormick, our entire task force, and Roger Zakheim and Rachel Hoff of the Raken Institute for their extraordinary support. Now it's my pleasure to turn the session over to our outstanding group of distinguished panelists and to let them share their insights on the task force findings and recommendations. Thank you. Um, thanks everybody for being here. Uh, good morning. I just want to do a little bit of housekeeping um, for our live audience and viewers online. Um, please submit questions via the uh, Reagan National Defense Forum app and on Twitter via the hashtag uh, RNDF. Um, thanks. Um, I've got an iPad here and I can see the questions. Um, so this report, as we just heard, is um, chock full of recommendations and analysis. I'm grateful to have some folks here um, who can discuss uh, the report from their different perspectives. Um, Congresswoman Chrissy Houlihan um, on, the, uh, on the task force that authored the report, um, similar to a congressional task force. Um, you probably also see this from your Air Force and um, corporate backgrounds. Um, Dr. Nadia Shadlow um, with the Hudson Institute, formerly Deputy National Security Advisor, um, author of the Trump Administration's National Security Strategy and Bob Sternfels, um, Global Managing Partner for McKinsey, whose research underpins a lot of the report. Um, so I just want to allow each of you a couple of quick minutes to react to what we just heard here, and then we can go into deeper questions. We have about 45 minutes, so feel free to, to roam a little bit if you want. Um, we can also we can talk about why Bob McCormick's not here. If anybody wants it, um, he was supposed to be here. We have ten extra minutes. Um, it might have something to do with the Senate race in Pennsylvania. Um, but anyway, so without further ado. 
me first? Sure. Um, hi, everyone. I'm Chrissy. I'm really glad to be here. And I, you know, my reflections do obviously have a lot to do with uh, my background. My kind of uh, engineering education is industrial engineering. I was educated in the uh, late 80s and early 90s, and supply chain management was something that was core to my, uh, my higher education and continues to be something that I use all the time. And my reflections on the work of this body as well as the work of the HASC, uh, similar task force, are uh, that the overlaps are profound, but one that's most remarkable is workforce, which I think Marilyn uh, highlighted. In fact, the HASC task force didn't even plan originally to talk about um, workforce and the importance of people in the supply chain until they discovered that it just kept coming up over and over and over again. And so what I would like to spend as much time as I am able to talking about is that when you talk about shocks to supply chains, when you talk about um, sovereignty in terms of control of our, our supply chains, you're really talking about a fundamental part of the manufacturing process, which is the people who do the work. Uh, and we need to make sure that we are thinking not only about reskilling and upskilling and all the things that Marilyn talked about, but we also need to make sure that we're thinking about the next generation as well. So there's a real uh, useful conversation to be had about the importance of pre-K, the importance of uh, early, early childhood literacy, the importance of kind of making sure that we're bringing people all the way up through the process to have the skills they need to be able to perform the tasks that we're asking them in this modern economy. Dr. Shadlow? Um, thanks. Uh, I have no, uh, no experience with engineering at all, so, <laughs> <laughs> so just, um, my goal is to offer a few thoughts about how to think about the report and as you read it in contrast to the way China is approaching some of this problem set. So I'll, I'll offer sort of three, um, three ideas in terms of uh, overarching um, the way China's approaching manufacturing. First, China used globalization in a deliberate effort to control its own vertical supply chain. The United States approached globalization as an opportunity to specialize and essentially to offshore. The Chinese actually did the opposite. They saw it as an opportunity to bring manufacturing to their country. Uh, so that's one of the fundamental differences. Uh, second, China chooses national champions. And the report actually, um, I don't know if it's fair to say it rejects it, but the Reagan administration report uh, notes um, the Reagan, um, uh, sorry, um, the Reagan Foundation report talks about national champions, but says this is not the way the United States should go. But I think that's something to think about. It's something for discussion, and I'm sure we'll get some questions about that. But it's a deliberate strategy, also that China has has taken, and it's also done quite well, right? It went from being uh, building no ships essentially in 2000 to being the largest shipbuilding um, country in the world. So it's actually worked for them. Huawei, they're over 90 national champions, and that's been a deliberate part of its manufacturing strategy. Third, it has appreciated the link between innovation and manufacturing. Uh, so early on, it understood that when you're manufacturing, a lot of innovation actually comes from that as well. And I, I think I encourage you to read um, some of the people early on who recognize this, some experts in the US, Willie Shi, Professor Koda, um, Tom Mahoney. They've written really interesting uh, articles about this really important link. I think now you know, we're shifting to begin to understand that, but it's important, um, it's important to know. So I'd highlight those three differences, and then I'll take some more, uh, hopefully, some more questions. Thanks. Super. Well, it's, um, it, it's, it's great to be here. I, I guess as I wade into this, I'd start with a thanks to, to Marilyn and David for, for leading us through this. I, I do think the comprehensiveness of, of what's in the report has lots of potential to be a catalyst uh, across a, a topic that is, is far, it's central to defense, but it's far broader. Um, I would also say this is one that uh, is a personal passion of mine as well. I, um, I had my first op-ed in the Wall Street Journal on this topic in 2004, uh, which talked about the notion of um, offshoring being overrated, which in 2004 went down like a lead balloon. Um, but, it, but it had the notion, shockingly, that short supply chains are better than long supply chains, that um, labor costs in highly engineered products are less than 15% of cost of goods sold, that we could actually get this right. And if I look at the last two years and the conversations that I've had with CEOs across all industries, I think the thing that has come home is that we undervalued resilience. And to your point on efficiency, we might have pushed the efficiency frontier, and we actually undervalued this notion of resilience. So I, I would start with I, I do think this is a central topic 
The, the second thing I would say is that I would argue this topic is much more holistic and critical to get right for us. Uh, it's critical from a defense point of view, but quite frankly, it's critical for an American economy and American way of life point of view. Um, if we do get it right, though, there's enormous potential. Um, we've done some work that says if we can revitalize U.S. manufacturing, that's anywhere between 275 and 460 billion added to U.S. GDP every year. So we can drive growth through this, which is a good thing. Back, back to the, uh, the notion of, of skill building in the next generation, this could be incredibly inclusive if we get this right. And we think about millions who could join the workforce in the heartland of America with well-paying jobs. And then one we haven't hit on, but this notion of climate, which is an ex uh, the question of our generation. The nice part here is the next generation manufacturing technologies allow us a twofer. We can actually be less emitting and more efficient on that front and more productive and actually avoid the trade-off. So I might pause this notion of also this is a broader topic as we wade into it. All right, thanks for those. Um, well, I, I want to start out with a question, um, well, like a reporter writing a story, right? You want to start out with something that grabs people's attention and something that grabbed my attention um, was this statistic, and there's a slide for it. Um, see if the slide comes up. <laughs> All right, well, um, 900 and there are 974,000 unfilled uh, manufacturing openings, and that uh, really kind of challenged uh, my expectations. I thought we have a lot of workers looking for work. I didn't realize that there are so many unfilled um, jobs and that there was this gap in the workforce. Um, but that uh, lagging productivity, uh, lagging capital investment, um, fragile, uh, supplier networks, um, those are all features of this report. And I, I wanted to go to you first, um, Bob. Can you paint, a little, uh, paint a, a little bit of a picture here? You know, how dire is the situation and how did we get here? How do, I mean, it's... It's yeah. a spike, yeah. yeah. Look, I, I, um, I'm right with you. I'd say three things. It is dire. It's solvable but we need to be radical as we think about solving it. And, and let me double click just a, a bit on that. You know, if, if we go to Dyer, some of the things that I would call out is our increase in productivity in manufacturing has atrophied from roughly 5% a year to almost nothing, hovering at about 1% a year. Um, you made the, the mention uh, of the spillover with R&D. Well, manufacturing is only 11% of US GDP but it represents 70% of the private sector's investment in R&D. 70% of the private sector's investment in R&D. So the implications around innovation of not getting this, this right are, are enormous. Um, the other aspect is, is back to this notion of inclusion. It's eroding our way of life. We've lost 4 million manufacturing jobs in the last 20 years, 4 million on net. We've also lost 70,000 small and medium-sized enterprises that support the supply chains in manufacturing, 70,000 small and medium-sized enterprises. And interestingly, on a relative wage rate basis, manufacturing jobs aren't as attractive as they were anymore. There was a study as late as 2016 which said one-third of manufacturing workers rely on food stamps. One-third. Right? So it, it is dire. Um, now, I'm an optimist, so <laughs> let, me, let me go to the next part. It's solvable, right? This is solvable. If you look at the existing technologies in what we talk about in Industry 4.0, so this isn't about next-gen technologies, it's about existing technologies. Our estimates are that would add 40% to productivity in U.S. manufacturing, 40%. It's a massive leapfrog if we can implement the technologies we have today. Equally, Back to the skills that workers need to implement this technology, it's not unknowable. Right? We know the exact skills that workers need to have to be able to implement Industry 4.0 technologies. So it's a solvable problem. And maybe finally, um, the private sector. I've had the chance as I've transitioned into my role over the last six months to talk to over 400 CEOs across sectors. There isn't one that doesn't talk about the top priority to upskill and reskill the workforce. So I think you do have a different ground in terms of a receptivity on the private sector to, to, uh, to radically invest here. 
But it may come to then my last point, which is incrementalism isn't going to get us here. We do need to think pretty radically in terms of solving this problem, and I'd, I'd highlight a couple. The way we think about education today won't get us to this, it won't solve this problem. You know, we have to think about how do you upskill in mid-career? Stepping out of the workforce and not getting paid while you get reskilled is not viable. So how do we think about boot camps? How do we think about more continuous learning? How do we actually think about incentives for employers to upskill? Think about the incentives for physical capital versus the incentives for human capital. They're totally different. And isn't human capital actually our most important asset? So how do we create an environment and incentive framework that allows us to do this? And potentially, given this gap is so, so large, could we ever think about a different approach to immigration that actually focuses on skills, a skill-based approach to this? But these are some of the radical solutions that might help us close this, close this gap. Well, um, and Dr. Shadlow, I wanted to see if you, you wanted to elaborate on any of the points that you had made earlier. If we can, since we're talking about sort of the, the you know, here's the hand that the United States is playing with. There's a, there is a sense of urgency in this report, and I think it's um, because of the American position relative to China, and, and we're looking at this in, a, in the framework of competition with China. Anything that, that you wanted to go in, uh, into greater depth with? Like, what's the, what do we know about how China approaches some of these questions? Well, I think that um, everything Bob said is there's an urgency to it, but the, the problem is as a government, I think there's, we still are struggling with how to actually um, you know, implement many of the recommendations in the report, the actual follow through and the implementation and the thinking. We haven't really decided as a country because there is no one way to do it um, of what, what our theory is for government role in this whole sector. I mean, the semiconductor, um, you know, um, uh, the semiconductor sector is a good example of this. Everyone is lauding the, the CHIPS Act, which is now part of the U.S. Innovation and Competitiveness Act, and everyone's very happy about the $52 billion that's in that to re-energize the U.S. semiconductor sector. But uh, when you actually go one level further, there's actually the possibility that that $52 billion is not going to really end up making a meaningful change because there's no consensus or of how to spend that money, right? And so that's a good, it might be specific, but I think it's actually a good example of how we're struggling as a country to figure out what the, what the role of government, it's not just more money, it's how that money is spent. Do we put it in early stage R&D in that sector? Should it go to fabrication facilities? Uh, should it um, go to R&D for design companies? Should it go to universities? There's no decision on that, so I'm actually a bit of a skeptic on what will happen um, to that 52 billion, whether or not we'll have a measurable impact on an important manufacturing sector in this country. You want, you want yeah, I'd like to kind of yeah. drill down on, on both of what you all have, have kind of lined up, which is that, um, first of all, that act that you're referring to, USICA, hasn't passed. Yep. And so we can talk all we want about how beautiful it would be if we had billions of dollars in the CHIPS you know, Act or in that industry. But as you've probably noticed in Congress, and particularly the relationship with the Senate and the Congress, those kinds of things that would seem like layups and obvious uh, solutions, at least you know, at least we would have the money, and then we could fight right. over how we're going to spend it. It still hasn't passed, and hopefully that will be something that will be taken up in the new year by the House um, of Representatives. So I share your despair, but for a different reason on, on that particular issue. And when you were talking about um, upskilling, reskilling, um, what would obviously be adults in, in our population. And I, uh, I started off by talking about children and the importance of um, uh, next generations. I think one of the things that we're struggling with when we look at this graph that, that went, oh, went away for you all, but shows this gap in uh, manufacturers struggling to fill o openings, is these are not all high-tech, high-skilled jobs. Uh, I have a chocolate manufacturer in my, um, in my district that makes the Easter bunnies for most of the country. And they have 200 manufacturing jobs that are open right now, good-paying manufacturing jobs with really good, uh, you know, 
benefits as well. I have a truck tra chassis manufacturer in my district. Again, not terribly technical uh, jobs with uh, more than 100 jobs that are available right now. And so as much as I appreciate the fact that we need to make sure that we're bringing in high skilled you know, uh, labor as an example, immigrants, we also need to just look at what we have and whether the, whether the people that we have right now even honor and respect the availability of manufacturing jobs. Because I think that this country has undermined the importance of manufacturing. And we talk to our kids about that this is not a place where you want to be. Where you want to be is in college. You know, where you want to be is, is uh, and your, your parents are telling you that, and your school is telling you that, and th we need to make sure that we're instructing uh, the opposite, that we're having people understand that it's okay, it's, it's honorable work to be in the manufacturing industry. And I think one of the uh, suggestions, both of the HASC uh, Armed Services Task Force and the Reagan Administration Task Force, is that there needs to be a collaborative initiative that is government-driven, that is uh, enterprise-driven, that is education-driven, that elevates the status and stature of being involved in the manufacturing sector in our, in our economy. Um, I, as I started the conversation, went to school, got an industrial engineering degree. Almost all of my colleagues went to McKinsey or Bain or investment banking. I was probably one of the only out of 100 people who graduated who actually went into manufacturing uh, because it was a stigma. That's not what you do with that kind of a degree. What you do is you go make money on Wall Street. Um, and that is still the thing that happens today, and we need to stop that kind of um, narrative. I hope that with COVID, one of the benefits of COVID mm -hmm. is that we've seen uh, the importance of manufacturing, and we've seen the vulnerability and what it means to national security, and we've seen that it's honorable work to be involved in making things. Is there a was I, I feel like I read this in the report. Is there a wage gap too, as as part of the issue that manufacture? Um, that workers involved in manufacturing aren't getting paid enough? What is the, do we know um, what the disincentives are for, for folks to, to be in manufacturing these days? There, I, I could highlight a couple. There is, um, on this real-time basis, um, a growing um, wage gap. So there is an aspect across all manufacturing um, uh, aspects of um, the, the appropriate wage gap. There's also a modernization in actual work methods that yield manufacturing relative to some others less flexible and therefore less exciting. And yet, some very implementable, easy technologies create more flexibility in manufacturing as you then think about what the role could actually offer. Um, but there's also a search, search gap issue. Um, and the understanding of where available jobs are relative to folks who are actually interested in them to fill some of the great ones you were talking about, there's act just a basic market clearing mechanism that doesn't exist. Um, I, I wanted to, um, I want to come back to semiconductors, but um, just wanted to give you an opportunity because you touched on the work with the, with the task force. Um, if folks don't know, there was a, there's a House Armed Services Committee task force that looked at these issues, and I just wanted to get a sense of, you know, if, if we're talking about uh, where there isn't, you know, where, where there's a disconnect on what the solutions are. Maybe this gives us an idea of where there's, a, there's some consensus. This is a bipartisan task force. Um, you know, what kinds of things did that come up with, uh, that task force come up with versus what uh, the Reagan task force came up with? Um, I did, I, in preparation for this, I did a little bar chart about this, and I would encourage you guys to read the reports of both um, Arm Reagan and also the HASC um, Special Task Force on, on Supply Chains, because they're actually quite short um, and condensed. And what I would say the similarities are is, of course, they were both focused on the um, in, importance of supply chains for national security. I would say one of the di bigger differences is that, of, of course, the task force on armed services was all members of Congress, bipartisanally, mm -hmm. uh, members of Congress who were on the Armed Services Committee. And as Marilyn mentioned, the, the Reagan task force was a combination of industry and government and, and education uh, as well. Um, as I mentioned initially, the Armed Services uh, Task Force was focused on a specific kind of output, like um, chips or um, rare earth elements or energetics or you know that kind of thing. And what we quickly realized is we weren't going to get a whole lot of places if we didn't also acknowledge the importance of workforce development, which I think obviously the Reagan Task Force did too. Uh, the Reagan Task Force talks, uh, as Marilyn talked about, about capital investment and the importance of, of that aspect. 
to some degree we hit on that on the on the armed services one but but it was much more the Reagan task force um, report is much more industry focused and in its relationship with um, education and government than ours was uh, we had the armed services task force had six different recommendations and our specific focus was to make sure they were actionable in the NDAA of this year and so they were all put forward into the NDAA of this year which hopefully will pass in the next week or two we can hope um, and, and that would be, uh, I guess, kind of the, sim the similarities and differences. I'm um, trying to make sure that I hit everything. I think the bottom line is both concluded that workforce, uh, uh, that supply chains are, should be a priority that we're not paying enough attention to, uh, and that it is a fundamental national security issue if we don't. Um, and I'm happy to talk to people about the HASC task force after this if you'd like. Another, just a, another point on workforce development is that it's very state driven, right? I mean, you have states that have different approaches to retraining programs and looking at some disconnects between the federal level um, at the, the big strategic level and then what actually happens at the state level. And I'm just wondering, I mean, I think maybe uh, Roger will kill me for give, you know, asking him to do another report, but it might be interesting as a sidebar to look at successful retraining programs of the past, right? Too often we, we, start, we tend to want to start from scratch. Mm. We tend to want, so we've been struggling with this issue uh, to various degrees for at least 15 years in a sense, right? So looking at actually what worked in the past in terms of uh, retraining and what didn't and the best way to communicate opportunity is to Bob's point. Uh, might be worthwhile. Well, well the, one of the recommendations in this report is to, uh, to allow employers to compete for federal funding that's normally reserved for colleges for, for skills training. I mean, is that politically viable? Does that feel like uh, that's, you know, does that feel like low hanging fruit? Is that something that, that um, Congress might so, be able to get behind Congress on a bipartisan basis? Uh, yeah. So I ish, I think. <laughs> um, I think that there are some already existing programs in my district, as an example, that mm -hmm. sort of look like a hybrid version of what you're talking about. I don't know that I would go so far as to say that uh, industry should necessarily be able to access Pell Grants, as an example, but maybe. Um, but I think what's happening in my district is some of the tech and vocational training and community colleges are working s side by side with industry and coordinating with over individual specific people. Um, upskilling and, and skilling those individual and specific people with the idea that they are on a path to head into industry with that p specific company. And, and with that, what I would share is, um, I, I mentioned that, I, that I, um, I'm an engineer, but I was an engineer under an ROTC scholarship, and I was told when I was 17 years old that my scholarship would be conditioned on the fact that I would be an industrial engineer because the needs of the military were that we needed industrial engineers. And that seems like a logical path that we should have replicated more than just in Air Force ROTC. We know what the needs are that we have in our workforce. We just need to match them up with the people who, who are, are interested in having uh, work. And so why wouldn't we identify the kinds of skills that we need at a vocational or community college level for industry and, and have pair, pr pair programs like that are happening in our community? I, I want to, uh, sorry, go ahead. Did you want to say oh, something? Oh, no, okay. I want to go back the, to the um, I, I wanted to jump to the to the semiconductor um, kind of rare earths questions. Um, you know, um, USICA and the Chips Act. Um, uh, there's you know are both uh, kind of languishing. There's a competing House me uh, measure. It seems like this is all sort of stalled out. You know, and and so it kind of makes me think of two questions. One, how it, how viable is um, how viable is, is increasing public investment um, in the private sector in the way that, the, that this report talks about? Is that something politically feasible? And then on, on the flip side, you know, does $50 billion, what does $50 billion get you in terms of investing in semiconductors? Can you, is that enough seed money to, to reshore? I mean, it, the, you know, I wish I had that graph, but I think we know that that um, Taiwan and China dominate in rare, you know, um, uh, in, in semiconductors. So, can 50, does fifty billion dollars get you there, Bob? What do you what do you think? Yeah, I maybe I, I won't comment as much on what's politically viable, but I I, I spent my my career um, working up and down the semiconductor uh, chain and, and have some sense. Fifty billion doesn't get you very far, right? You know, one one facility costs twenty billion. Uh, on a, a, to be at a leading edge node, just to put some in, in, in contrast. And um, 
you know, the, the quantum, at least in some of the research that we did, said to get U.S. back to competitive parity across um, the front end side of, of, of semiconductors, which is the fab, which is where most of the technology is as opposed to assembly and test, is about $3 trillion. So we're, we're 60x what we're talking at the 50 level. Now, um, that is only in the manufacturing point. And Nadia, you raised this question earlier. When you start to think about the broader supply chain, there's some really interesting both technology and strategic questions. Um, the importance of, of front-end manufacturing, sure. But what about semiconductor equipment? And you start to think about things like lithography. And it's the equipment that actually goes into the factories which actually has often strategic pinch points. So that widens the scope. The three trillion was just in the manufacturing side of things. You then think about back to this small and medium-sized enterprise notion that we talked about in the atrophying of the 70,000 SMEs over the last 20 years. There's an enormous number of small and medium-sized enterprise that provides the componentry into the supply chains for the equipment to make this happen. That investment's not considered in that equation. So my, my big push would be the numbers we are talking about when we actually think about how to truly come back to leading edge competitiveness around this are a quantum. But I would also say that we shouldn't say that um, government funding solves all that. <laughs> you know, I, in my mind, I think we have to think about many different aspects. And I'm not knocking the role of government funding. I think it's a critical, perhaps, catalyst to get going. But how do you turn that into a, a multiplier? And so how do you turn it into a multiplier when if you're sitting in the shoes of, of leading a private business, these are decade-long investment risks. So back to this uncertainty, we need to create an environment that gives some clarity. If I'm going to make a bet that's going to be a 10-year payback, do I have certainty around the regulatory environment? Regulatory environment here, and maybe with the US working with allies, regulatory environment internationally. Um, is there the appropriate incentive to make my own both R&D and capital investments? And I actually think this notion that Marilyn talked about, could there be some alternate financing vehicles at the intersection of public and private? I don't know if this notion of a of a sovereign wealth fund, but when you go around the world and you look at places like Singapore, or Norway, et cetera, they've been incredibly successful on this to catalyze targeted investment. And so there might be some creative solutions in it that allow us to get to a number far larger, but doesn't rely on a, on a specific number through a, through a bill to, to do this, I think, if we're going to try and solve it. Dr. Shadlow? Well, I think further complicating the point about private capital and the role is that a lot is still flowing into China, right? Some 50% of R&D centers in China over the years uh, have been financed by U.S. and non-Chinese companies in China. Most recently, what I found really surprising uh, was a, report, a Wall Street Journal report which um, noted that from 2017 to 2020, there were 58 deals made into the Chinese semiconductor space by uh, by Western and U.S. companies. This is over the past four years when we purportedly have this bipartisan consensus on, on, <laughs> on China. So that's a problem. That's worth billions of dollars of deals. So the private capital is there. Uh, you know, this is not a new observation, but getting Wall Street to recognize uh, the long-term uh, downside of these kinds of investments is still a, still a struggle. Is in, and you know, what's your sense of why Congress is wrapped around the axle on these questions and, and can't, um, you know, hasn't been able to move forward um, to reconcile the, um, you know, these competing approaches and... and um. I can only speak for myself. Um, I'm candidly frustrated because I feel like that the Senate put forward a good piece of legislation in USICA it was, in this day and age, pretty remarkably bipartisan in terms of, I think it had 68 votes in the Senate. Um, I serve on one of the committees of jurisdiction for our versions of that in the foreign affairs space. Uh, I know that there are bits and pieces of it across other parts of the House. Um, and I know that we're trying to pass versions or parts of the USICA through the House, through those committees of jur jurisdiction. But I this is an example of a case where I get frustrated as, a, as an individual member that um, why wouldn't we move forward on something that at least starts progress? Um, but I'm sort of a pragmatic, you know, I, incrementalist. I would, right. I guess, it is is a bad word, but it's sort of where I am, where it's rather to have something than to have nothing. Mm -hmm. um, so I don't have any comments other than I think there is a lot of fiefdom stuff, not surprisingly, in in Congress. 
and a lot of not invented here stuff as well. So, you know, something that we haven't talked about is the White House. You know, has the White House, there have been a number of um, um, supply chain, you know, uh, in this lane, we've seen a number of executive orders from the White House. Has the leadership been um, strong enough? Um, is that what's needed here to kind of break up the log jam? Um, is there anything that, that the White House has um, put out there in, through executive orders that's uh, been effective? You know, whether it be, um, you know, so, I mean, they're, I guess they're geared primarily towards supply chain studies at this point and maybe not necessarily towards um, acting on on kinks in the in the hose, or have they? Well, there there was, as you noted, the hundred day supply chain review, which came out. It does provide a good background in four different sectors, um, but mainly, you know, background. There, the recommendations tend to be um, more government spending, but tends to tend to not address the point um, made earlier about how to best you know spend that money, incentives, um, uh, you know. Uh, how, how to actually spend the money and the most effective way to do that. And it also highlights problems like the um, you know, talent problems. But the solution side of how you get there, I think, is still, still a problem. Uh, in addition, many have, many have pointed out, and I agree, that pouring uh, money uh, into the Department of Commerce to lead this effort is potentially problematic uh, because there really isn't the workforce there that has the skill set to implement these pretty complicated uh, programs. Well, the only thing I might add on this, though, is uh, everyone needs to do their part. Back, back to, I don't know if it's incrementalism or let's take the wins where we can, uh -huh. you know, however you want to frame it. Um, you know, we'd, we'd been, as a country, on a long-term decline in terms of our both CapEx and R&D spend in manufacturing over the last 20 years. In 2020, that turned around in the, in the private sector. In advance of this moving from studying to funds flowing or new policies. And I think if there is some um, reward in the markets for companies that are actually now starting to take bold investments about reimagining supply chains, doubling down on R&D, et cetera, this could work in concert with each other. And it doesn't need to be sequential of government moves, then private sector moves. Mm -hmm. Can we get both moving? in parallel at the same if, time. If I could comment on that, one of the other commonalities between the two reports was the, um, on one report, the sort of reimagining of the Defense Production Act and what could we do to be more creative with, with that tool that we have that I understand needs to be renewed in another few years. Uh, on the other report, it was um, making it more useful rather than reimagining it. And we, I think we do have some real power in that particular tool to do exactly what you're saying in terms of incentivizing business and, and thinking more broadly. I, I read at one point in one of the in the report, the Reagan one, um, that there was work done, I believe it was in the Vietnam era, to spread out aluminum manufacturing across the, the country and make it uh, less vulnerable to, um, to attacks to infrastructure. And I think we can do those kinds of things, be, be creative with the way that we um, use the DPA. Um, be happy to try and hear your ideas on that too. I, somebody, um, so I wanted to turn, we've got a little less than 10 minutes left. I wanted to turn to some of the questions. Um, and one I noticed, somebody's asking to put a finer point on something that we talked about. Is there a bipartisan consensus that we need an industrial policy that involves direct investment of federal funds into the formation of manufacturing capabilities? Is the ideological contention over industrial policy over or not? Anybody want to weigh in on that one? I don't know quite what the, what the question is asked or getting after. Can you or clarify it a little bit? Um, I think is there is there a is there a, a, a split over whether um, there needs to be direct investment in yeah, I mean, in we, federal funds? I think that's what's being asked. We had a conversation about this at, at the breakfast table where we were talking about. Um, I feel very much that uh, that the government should be able to invest in and and be part of the uh, process of being participating with for-profit com companies, but I think that the government should also benefit from that as well. And I think that there's a struggle where there's kind of this feeling that we should be open-handed and giving money for research and development and giving money for innovation and then not profiting or benefiting from it. And I'd like to see that there be some sort of, we were talking about venture, venture capital funds in the US Air Force. That's kind of uh, blue skying it, mm -hmm. but why wouldn't we have something like that right now when we're trying to find innovation and, and we're not able to do it, we're not able to generate it. 
I don't know, I'm just, I'm just speaking again for myself, I don't know that my more progressive colleagues would be down for that, um, but that's you know, where my perspective is. I, I wonder if there's, a, if there's um, you know, some ideological issues on both sides. You know, um, uh, you know does this, uh, is this counter to free market principles? Um, if we were to invest in, if we're, if, you know, if we're propping up some segment through public investment, at what point does that end or does that go on and on? You know, is that a continuous thing? Yep. The only part I, I'm not going to opine on is there bipartisan support or not. Um, but back to free market principles, um, I think one of the things that we're learning, whether it's on things like um, this notion of resilience versus efficiency, or externalities that we hadn't considered in our objective function in enterprise, like climate, um, that free markets um, are taking, we're taking a broader definition of externalities. And one of the, the definitions, at least in my mind, comes back to this notion of supply chain resilience. I don't think this is working against free markets at all. It's coming back to say, look, we're gonna have increasing shocks going forward, and we don't know what those next set of shocks are gonna be. Is the economic system that we're building robust enough to deal with these particular shocks? I think that's entirely consistent with a free market, uh, free market system. I don't think there's bipartisan support, especially on the Republican side. There's still a lot of debate about the, the, um, whether or not you want to pick national champions and make investments in specific um, companies. That's the, actually, there's a, there's a question yeah. here that says, are you concerned that the creation of defense manufacturing system that creates national champions in the same manner as China would remove the competitive advantage that markets provide? So that's, that's a sentiment out there. Um, Let's, um, let's to the congresswoman's yeah. point, I just want to add, I think it's an interesting point about government. Um, I mean, government investments, if you do make them, traditionally it's all been about you just get the loss, essentially. <laughs> you don't actually get the gain, the for-profit gain. And uh, some, some have written, there's a great book called The Entrepreneurial State. Um, never met the author, but plugging it. Uh, and and uh, she <laughs> talks about actually a different model in which government would actually get some of the profits, not just take the fall. You know, one notion back to this national champion I might frame as we think about it is, do we want national champions or do we want championship teams? And what I do wonder about in our system is, is our issue not picking a national champion, but rather we don't work very well across the silos. And a lot of the solutions, particularly as we think about manufacturing and defense, are going to need multiple players to collaborate. And so I just, it may be a notion of, could we rethink the model to create championship teams as opposed to national champions? Um, I just want to uh, give a, f a couple other folks who have a submitted questions. Um, um, Brian McGrath of the Ferry Bridge Group um, asked for the panel, are there creative policy proposals that will help with the physical mobility of the workforce? Um, we have chocolate factory jobs in Pennsylvania and unemployed and underemployed elsewhere. How do we use federal and state tax codes, for instance, to bring them together? So if I, I, I understand the question, but I'm going to answer it in a different way. One of the geographic challenges of my part of, of Pennsylvania is transportation and infrastructure uh, is an issue. We have jobs in places where people cannot get to them. So in the case of the Morgan Truck Company, which does the chassis, it's in a part of my, my district that doesn't have transportation. Uh, public transportation readily available. Uh, in the case of the chocolate manufacturing, sim similarly, not very easily able to get there. So we've worked on all kinds of creative solutions to try to bus people or to try to connect, as an example, one of those businesses with veterans from the VA um, uh, that's in my community as well. So I don't know that we necessarily need to have like mass migrations across the nation to, to, to try and you know, match jobs with people. We just need to have better infrastructure that is able to get people to those jobs, and I'll also to you know play my my uh, my democratic music as well. You know we need to make sure that we have childcare, and <laughs> we need to make sure that we have people who can leave their house safely because they don't feel like they're going to die of COVID. Um, and so there's a lot of work that needs to be done to be able to before you start moving people from Ohio to Pennsylvania. Anybody else want to wait? No. Um, and then I'll, I'll um, uh, there's a, another question about. Um, semiconductor parts. We'd been talking about semiconductors, um, reshoring it here in the States. Um, how can the U.S., uh, it says the, 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 there's a report by Boston Consult 
consulting group that suggests more than 90 percent of advanced semiconductor parts um, that America uses, including to build the F-35, were built exclusively by the Taiwanese semiconductor manufacturer TSMC. How can the U.S. incentivize foreign semiconductor manufacturers to move their plants to the United States? I guess as opposed to, you know, watering the ground and having them grow here naturally. Bob, yeah, I mean, yeah, we're ahead. trying to do, no, yeah, go ahead, Bob, and we're trying uh, to do that now. I, 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 absolutely, and if you do look at some of the big announcements, right, they have been players like Samsung, which, by the way, back to our 50 billion, Samsung, as one company, has announced 250 billion in capital spend for semiconductors. There's a large chunk of that that actually should be in, in the U.S., and if you look at um, the recent announcements around new facilities just outside of Austin, right, this is, this is one of them. So I'm, I'm clearly there. I would, I'm sorry to get into the kind of language, but when we talk about parts mm -hmm. as opposed to fabs and the TSMCs and the Samsungs will build entire facilities, there are equipment players that are people like Applied Materials, which is a U.S. company, ASML, which is a Dutch company, and actually encouraging the development of semiconductor equipment, which runs the factories, is a real leverage point for us that we could actually think to revitalize and figure out where are the next generation equipment manufacturers. Because if we have dominance in the equipment manufacturers, they're the ones who actually put the facilities together. All right, I'm going to let that be the last word um, and thank all of the questions that we got from the audience. Thank you, the audience for being here. Thank you for, uh, to the panelists um, for discussing this today. Um, all right, round of applause. Thank you. Thank you.